Working okay? Do out to just right? Hi, my name is George Edson. I'm chairman of the Montpelier Historical Society. And just a few opening remarks about why we're here. Uh, about a year ago, I looked at my computer this morning and found that just about a year ago, almost to the week, uh, several of us got together thinking that the Montpelier Historical Society might want to get revitalized. We knew that it existed. It had been dormant for a decade. And Catherine Guerre and Mike Doyle and Bev Hill and myself met. A few public meetings followed. Uh, nomination of a board of directors followed. And an election of that board and then officers. And a penalty for stirring the pot meant that I was elected chairman. <laughs> and our vice chairman is Jennifer Boyer, somewhere. And Jennifer uh, comes to the table with a great deal of history, uh, research, and writing from Central Vermont and Montpelier. Jennifer knows every antique map there is. And if you want to know anything about maps, you see Jennifer. Bev Hill is our secretary. And Bev it knows everybody, and everybody knows Bev. And I think she's held most of the elective or non-elective offices in the county and the city. And Catherine Guerre is our treasurer. Catherine was a part of the previous society. And I think she wanted to be treasurer to make sure we didn't blow the little bit of money that we inherited. And uh, I think we've done OK on that. Catherine is the daughter of the late Paul Guerre. Paul was real instrumental in historical um, activities here in Montpelier. And Catherine is carrying on that legacy. For directors, we have uh, Paul Carnahan, amazingly lucky to have Paul on our board. You all know Paul is a librarian at the Leahy Library at the Vermont Historical Society in Barrie. Danny Cohn, I could say everybody in Montpelier knows Danny, but I think everybody in the state knows Danny through his musical, where's Danny? Yeah. Through his musical uh, exercises, and Danny is a native Montpelierite and very interested in Montpelier history. Thumper Colombo, who was a uh, principal at Dubois and King, and is a, uh, again, another native, you don't have to be a native, but anyway. <laughs> And a, a, a classmate of mine in Montpelier High School, and Thumper is kind of the go-to guy when we need to get something done. Um, next is Corinne Cooper. She isn't here tonight. Corinne is the president of the Berlin Historical Society and tells us kind of how these things should be done. And there's one other C word I thought I could remember if I went alphabetical. Who am I forgetting? Uh, I'm forgetting of somebody whose name starts with C. Then we have Eric Gilbertson, and Eric was to be a part of the program today, and Eric had a little, little health problem, minor health problem, that prevented him from coming. But again, Eric is, is a huge addition to our board, spent his life in, <laughs> Bev's, Bev's telling me who I forgot. Paul, no, I did, I, I did him first. Whoops, this is, uh, I think you can. Eric Gilbertson. Eric Gilbertson. Yeah, you might have hit something. Eric Gilbertson spent his life, his career, in historic preservation and was the historic preservation officer for the state of Vermont. Can you all hear me? And this little light has gone out. And Eric was also on the Preservation Society of Vermont uh, board, also the Precision Museum in Windsor. Eric brings a lot to the table. And Mike Doyle. Mike was an original uh, member of the Montpelier Historical Society years ago. And Mike Doyle, if you look on uh, YouTube, you'll find pictures, you'll find videos of Mike leading tours of the State House. And uh, Steve Ribellini. Steve is a, another local person, and Steve has shown his uh, tremendous support, his, his uh, belief in Montpelier by investing in Montpelier, and Steve is on our board too. 
So we are looking to do three things primarily. One is to get space to meet in and work on our collection. And we'd like that space to be free because we don't have much money. Which reminds me, we'd like you to join our society today. And my wife, Jill, some of you may have known Dr. Carnahan. I married the veterinarian's daughter. And my wife, Jill, is standing up back and would be glad to have you. Uh, Don't touch that. Yeah, to have you join. So please, before. It's you. We'll try it again. D hold it down here, though. Yeah. So another activity we're looking to become engaged in, you're here for today, and that is public programming. And Catherine Guare was in charge of this program and has done a fantastic job, as you can see by the turnout today. Uh, lastly, we want to foster the research and writing of local history. And uh, I could talk all day about that, but if you have more interest in in writing things, whether it's your neighborhood, the house you grew up in, uh, anything about Montpelier that is first person history is particularly of interest. You're the person that lived it, you're the person that knows it, you didn't do research, you, you lived it, but also any other particular thing. I'm, there, uh, Hubbard Park, the Green Mount Cemetery, I'm sure they all have histories at hotel, but Somebody bringing those histories together, bringing them up to date is important. So anyway, that's uh, what we're looking to do too. Public programming, we'll have another. Catherine has some ideas for the fall program, which is gonna be uh, outstanding. And we also have a cracker exhibit, the common cracker that's gonna open at the History Museum in August. And there is an opening reception for that on August 6th. So uh, that's the other activity. And other than that, joining us would be helpful. Uh, we need your money. And uh, yes? Business cards on the table. Business cards on the table with our contact information. And uh, we welcome you to join us. And that's it. So uh, Catherine, you want to pass this around and start the, the tell portion of our program? Sure. <clears throat> Well, so the mic is a little tricky. Um, we're just going to pass the microphone around and give all of the exhibitors a chance to talk for about five minutes regarding their family's history and their business in Montpelier. So we'll start with Fred Bashara. Fred, when you're done, you can just pass it on down. Hold it right down the clock. Yes, Good afternoon. I started in Norwich in 59, married my wife in 62. So we're coming up on our 60th anniversary. Actually started, actually started working at the Paramount before I was married in 1960. Then afterwards we worked with my father, my Richard Cody, uh, who was the Montpelier Ice Company, you'll hear that from Bobby. Uh, 1980, our family split. Everybody wanted to retire, we didn't. We were only in our 50s. So we ended up buying Capitol Theater, the Paramount Theater, and three laundromats. And our family grew from there. They had come out of college. Each one came back and worked with us. In 1992, you had a big flood in Montpelier. We had a big flood in Montpelier. And the resulting was the, when the hotel went into bankruptcy. It was bought by previously, two years earlier, by John Kilmurray and Irving Anders. This is not working. That's OK. I'll talk later. Hold lower. Anyway, all right, I'll hit myself. <laughs> Anyhow. We bought the hotel in bankruptcy, out of bankruptcy, after five other owners went bankrupt in 93 and opened it up as the Capitol Plaza as you see it today. We opened up with 39 rooms. We now have 74 and we're adding another 10 uh, within a couple of months. We'll be working over the summertime. Jay Morgan's is also our family run, as well as the Capitol Theater. There's pictures over here of the Capitol Theater. It was called the Playhouse. I have, finally go back to about 1938 with the pictures and you'll see pictures of the uh, elm trees in front of the playhouse. And then you'll see a picture of an elm tree falling through the playhouse and a picture of it boarded up. <laughs> One year later, in 1939, it burned to the ground. And if you look at the outside of the building, you'll see the, the supporting pillars that are still there. They built around it. Now, 
um, Claire Guerr, her father was called Nelson Paxman. He was one of the carpenters that built the Capitol. He started on one side, and they had another man called Jerry Dashner started on the other. They hated each other so badly that the contractor would not let them get near each other. <laughs> when they got near the back, they had to separate them. That same year, 1939, 489 Elm was built. That was my father-in-law's house, my wife's house. He built the Bud Cody's house a few years later and built my house in 1966 at the age of 68. And he and I worked together and built that house. Uh, I don't think some of them even you know it was over there. Anyhow, we had a great time in Montpelier. We love it. I have four children. Uh, we just graduated the ninth graduation from college uh, Friday. I've got three more to go. So <laughs> here, Don, you take it over. Here we go again. Um, <clears throat> as you know, I'm from Cap I'm Don Bigglestone from Capital Stationers. We originally started in 1950 when my dad was a traveling salesman out of Boston and he bought out a little shop called Richmond Office Equipment. There, shortly after, in 1952, we obtained a, a bookstore called Lincoln Lily, which was over next to the fire station. We combined the Capital Station is with Lincoln Lilly, and eventually we bought out Mr. Lilly. Um, shortly after that, we purchased Harrington's Gift Shop, which was down next to the where the Capitol Plaza is. There was a building which was the J. Leo Johnson building, and the gift shop was in one side of it. And it's interesting that J. Leo Johnson building also operated as a warehouse for us, because you could drive your vehicle up onto the second floor on a wooden ramp and we kept office furniture up there. And so we had three locations going in Montpelier at that time. So McClellan's building, which is now Walgreens, came up for sale and we purchased that in 1967 and we took the three stores, put them all into one. So in 1967 we came under one roof. But that roof started leaking. So we were gonna have to shut down for a period of time to rebuild the roof. So our contractor up in Barrie, Roland Lajeunesse, said, why don't you just put a second floor up over the top? So what we did is we straddled the original building and put another floor on the, up above so we didn't have to shut down. We could keep on operating, which was pretty helpful. And uh, after we moved in there, we had started selling office furniture from that on the second floor, and we didn't need the warehouse anymore. Then we got a little bit bigger and we ended up buying the old Marvin and Cooley Dairy up on, um, what's that street, Berlin Street. And that became our warehouse for a while. And then the community center um, was going out of business and so we took over the community center, which is where the police department is now, and we turned that into a warehouse for us. And then at the same time, we were expanding in other locations and we had, um, Gotten to the point that we had nine stores at that point. We had, uh, I had a, about 120 employees and we were all over the northern part of Vermont. And then we had one store in, it was kind of called our vacation store. It was in Florida at the uh, Sawgrass Country Club. So we could go down and watch the TPC tournaments and uh, get into that for, for free and could play golf there. Uh, then the flood came in 1992 and that just about wiped us out because we uh, uh, were storing, storing a lot of merchandise in the lower level of our store, which is the Walgreens store. And there was no insurance because it was below ground. So we lost the inventory for five stores or it, it really did a job on us. Um, but we've had a lot of fun over the years. And uh, where we had locations was we were in Barrie, Montpelier, St. Alba, uh, St. Johnsbury, Waterford, um, three locations in Burlington and one in, in Florida. So that kept me pretty busy running around between all the stores and it was a lot of fun. Interestingly though, when we first opened, my dad had a little thing in the window uh, giving away a puppy. 
and some little kid won the puppy and took it home. And I don't want to tell you about the phone call that my dad got about having a little puppy sent home. And it wasn't met with the best success. But we've had a lot of interesting other things. One little story I like to tell is that we were store in the Berlin, up at the Berlin Mall, I had a store called Mr. B's. And I was up there working one day, and somebody came in and wanted a certain product, and I said, well, we don't have that here, but if you go downtown to Capital Stationers, they have it. And the person looked at me and says, I don't like them. I'm not going to buy from them. That's why I come up here. <laughs> I, for once, kept my mouth shut. <laughs> so we've had some fun over the years. And uh, I, I don't know what else to tell you. I don't want to hold you up too long. So I'll turn it over to the Cody's and they can talk into the microphone that's not working. Hey. I'll just leave the microphone alone. I'm Bob Cody. First of all, I'd like to thank Catherine for dragging us out today to do this on a nice Sunday. And uh, George Edson, gosh, Uncle Fred and I were watching you on the podium. She said, oh my God, that's land up right there. Yeah. Just like, um, the story of Cody Chevrolet starts with my grandfather. He moved here in 1922, 23, sometime in that time frame. And uh, he bought the Montpelier Ice Company. Um, then uh, my grandfather was pretty entrepreneurial. My grandmother was very conservative, so she, my grandfather just kept wanting to buy things and do things. My grandmother would always keep them, you know, like, let's see if we can afford this. But she, she made sure he didn't have too many follies. But um, so uh, in uh, 1956, my grandfather had a building here on Berry Street, and Main Street, and it was a dealership called Downey Chevrolet. And back in those days, you just had one car in the showroom. And people would come in and take that car, and there'd be another car coming in. They didn't have lots or anything like that. And so um, the, my grandfather loved automobiles. That, he, he, he always liked big automobiles. And he thought, you know, after having known the theater business, you've got to get in the car business. This is, what, this is what seems to be growing. So in 1956, he um, um, purchased it from, at that time, it was H.O. Taylor. And there were two stores. There was one in Barrie where, um, where the uh, old Dairy Queen, right in back there, and that was named Bud Chevrolet, and the one here on the corner of uh, Main and Berry Street was called Cody Chevrolet. When they signed the agreement with Chevrolet Motor Division, they required them to build a new building in five years. So in three short years, they built the building that we are presently in on the Berry Montpelier Road in 1959. There's some pictures here of when they opened it up. And at the time, it was quite a, I, I was born in 61, so I, I don't know any of this. I just had to get the stories from my older brothers and sisters and from my father. But uh, at the time, it, uh, my father was the president. He was the oldest of the uh, four Cody boys. And um, all of them became officers in the company. Um, my Uncle Bud uh, ran the uh, sales department. My father ran the service department. And Uncle Don ran the uh, treasury. And I think at that time, Uncle Ray was... So the, he was a strong. Yeah, he's, he, he was up at the Strong Theater in Burlington. But he was still, you know, they're all, my grandfather always used to divide everything equally amongst the boys. So um, that, that's, that's how everything started. And obviously, uh, everybody knows the history of automobiles. They took off. The 1956, 57, 58, it just kept expanding, expanding, expanding. Where the present property, where Cody Chevrolet is located, right next to it used to be the old drive-in movie theater. <laughs> and... Um, so we were very fortunate, but back in, my father tells a story back in the day when my grandfather had those movie theaters and, uh, and they put the dealership there, the Bear Montpelier Road it was just starting to be well-traveled. There wasn't a lot of people going back and forth to Barry, you know, so it was a, a very prosperous time for my family to, uh, to do that. And um, so fast forward a few years, uh, uh, the next generation, uh, as Uncle Fred said, the uh, Cody boys got a little older. They decided, let's start splitting up the businesses because they all owned them together. And my father ended up with Cody Chevrolet. My Uncle Bud ended up with Midtown Chrysler Plymouth. I heard you talk about J. Leo Johnson. Um, my family bought that in 1964 and built a building that is presently Mid-State Chrysler Plymouth. And uh, so that's how we end up. And then so my brother and I got into the business. My sister Robin was already in the business. And we kind of helped my father, he was getting older. So we uh, got in the business and, and that was, it was good because I had a job. I got out of college, I had a job. I didn't have to go hit the pavement. 
and I've been there. I, I grew up at the dealership, and um, so that's pretty much it. We've been, we've been very fortunate that we've always run it as a family business, but the people that have worked for us have been just amazing. We've had employees. We had one employee that worked over 50 years for us, David Simpson, and uh, all the employees that we've had over the years, uh, some of them helped bring me up, you know, when they were older. You know, the, I called the dealership, they they'd always, always were very generous to us. But um, believe it or not, we have two or three employees now that work for us. Uh, one uh, a sales uh, manager for us, uh, Jay LeCare, his grandfather was our body shop manager. And my new body shop manager, his father was a mechanic, Ron Page, for years. So the family thing just continues on, and, and uh, we've been very blessed. And, very thankful to the Montpelier and Barry community for having us all these years. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you. I'm Patrick Healy from Green Mount Cemetery. Thank you for inviting me. Um, the cemetery began, it was dedicated, there's a hymn here, a copy of the hymn. It was dedicated on September 15, 1855. It was part of the Rural Garden Movement for Cemeteries, which as you know, there's a lot in Boston. A lot of them are in New England. Um, and they wanted something that was right outside of the city, overlooked the river. They looked at, and, and the, we face south, um, so it's kind of a, a natural amphitheater facing south. And the only thing we can see a little bit now is the interstate. But other than that, we're not seeing any buildings. And so it's really, a, I think it was a, a great place to choose. Now, Calvin Keith, prominent lawyer in Montpelier, is the one who donated money to buy land suitable for a cemetery. Now remember, suitable for a cemetery was in 1855. You, who would buy a hill that we we're going to be having lawnmowers 100 years later? But <laughs> nobody knew about that then. So I have a picture here from 1875, and it shows the hillside. A few trees are coming up. It's back when, the, when there were a lot of sheep farms in Vermont. So most of this area did not have trees, didn't have deer. So they could put in a rural garden cemetery um, and not worry about uh, deer eating everything up. Um, the other thing, he, so he wanted a couple of things, Calvin Keith, when he gave the money to the city. He wanted it to be planted thickly with trees, and we're starting to see some 150-year-old trees coming down now. Um, he wanted a park given to the poor. Those, are, those were his two conditions. The city matched the amount of money. They set up a, it's a kind of a quasi-municipal corporation. Um, there's five publicly elected commissioners that run the city, run the cemetery in trust for the city. So we do not work for the city council. We work, we work with them. We work with the city manager, but we're not directly under them. And that's how, that's how it works. And I think mostly because of money. They wanted to make sure the money stayed away from the town fathers. Um, and that's, that's only what I've been told. Um, it makes sense. Um, so anyways, we have 35 plus acres down there. There's, over three and a half miles worth of roads. Um, you've got to be a half a mountain goat to walk a lot of the, a lot of the ridges, a lot of the terraces. Um, back when we started, well, not when we, but they started in 1855, it was a pine box casket, simple. Maybe some embalming, maybe not. It's gone full circle. It's now coming back to pine boxes or just going in natural um, without being embalmed and we're, we're allowing that we're working it out also back then there wasn't any lawnmowers there wasn't a combustion engine we're, we're going back to much of the old part of the cemetery not being mowed um, un until the fall and so that's what we're, tr we're struggling with um, we're, and it's kind of working out with covid because our main workforce has been with the Department of Corrections uh, probably since 1982. I've been there 35 years, and um, so hopefully we'll have corrections back, but we're gonna be doing other things with them. There's a lot of work that, a lot of retaining walls, a lot of monuments that need to be fixed and straightened. Um, so anyways, I've got some 
different um, pictures here. I even have a picture that Bev Hill gave me of her aunt, Aunt Emma, um, riding in a horse and buggy around the, the uh, stairs that were carved in the um, ledge on the sharp corner. That was done by a Civil War vet. We have over 105 Civil War vets throughout the cemetery. We have, we have hundreds of veterans down there. And um, one of the things we always need is someone to help us find these. We're, we're finally getting a map made digitally so that we can start making special maps for the cemetery. So if anybody wants to volunteer time, just let me know. Um, what else do we have here? We have a log book here. One of the things about cemeteries, Green Mount, where, whoever, St. Augustine's, there's a lot of history there. If you know how to connect the dots, you can see in, in uh, like in 1875, the middle of the cemetery, mostly marble monuments. Once in the late 1800s, early 1900s, when they figured out how to quarry granite, which was much harder, then that they went to granite. So they started with slate, then they went to marble, then they went to, to uh, granite. Um, there's just so much history that can, and a lot of lessons that need to be learned and need to be recorded for everybody. Okay, um, and the biggest lesson that I've learned recently, when COVID started, I looked up in 1918 when the Spanish flu occurred. And I just went from August 30th to like December 15th, 75 burials in 110 days. Keep in mind, that wasn't with our mini excavator that we have now, that was with a shovel. And the only reason they stopped is it was because it was winter. So there's a lot of lessons to be learned at any cemetery, there's a lot, there's just so much information there and it takes a lot of people to, to work on. So thank you, and I'm always open to tours for groups of people. Um, so if you ever need a tour, just let me know. We can walk, we can ride, doesn't matter. So thank you. Thanks, Pat. You want me to move this down? Well, it's a recorder for the cameraman. Oh, okay. Oh, do you see? My father-in-law, Bill, started the lobs at the pot way back when, probably in the 40s. I'll hold it. I'll hold it for you. At one point, he wanted to have five restaurants in Montpelier, which he did have, one for each son. Unfortunately, the sons went off to war, came back, decided they didn't want to be in the restaurant business. He was buying Miller's Inn, so he decided to keep that one, and that's where the first lobster pot was. He had the lobster pot from there until 1970 when he sold it to his son Paul and myself. We ran it until 2001 when we retired, and I have some of the memorabilia here, here from way back when. Thank you. Thank you. sick of coming back to Montpelier from, from the week school where he was working for Latin lessons, so we finally moved back to Montpelier and went into the bakery. And I have two articles, one about the bakery starting and one about the boys in the early 1970s. It's called Family Enterprise Frying Donuts. A fondness for homemade donuts like Mother used to make was what started a Montpelier man baking as a hobby years ago and he soon will be opening his own bakery shop in the Tomasi Block on Main Street. Paul S. Redmond of 7 Lincoln Avenue, Montpelier, will be opening his shop in about two weeks and will specialize in all types of donuts, bread, and squares. I first started baking donuts for the fun of it at home because I remembered how good my mother's donuts tasted, said Redmond. And the next thing I knew, my kids were selling them to the folks in the neighborhood. 
Redmond baked his first donut about 20 years ago and still has a yen for them. He worked at Cross Bakery until six years ago when he began his own business, doing all the baking in the kitchen of his home. It's still going to be pretty much of a family enterprise with Mrs. Redmond and their six children joining in to help. <clears throat> and then this is an article about the bakery, which was in the Retail, Retail Bakers Week magazine. Bakers get their due respect. That hero of the morning and savior of the palate, the hometown baker, is finally getting long overdue recognition when the country acknowledges independent Retail Bakers Week, February 28th through March 4th. For visitors to Montpelier, the journey down Main Street begins with the wafting aromas of freshly baked goods from Paul's Bake Shop, a fixture in the capital city for the past 25 years. Paul T. Redmond and crew begin their day at 1.30 a.m. In, pre in preparation for the onslaught of hungry workers seeking sustenance from their handmade donuts and freshly baked brewed coffee. The originator of Paul's Bake Shop, Paul S. Redmond, Paul T. Redmond's father, began his baking career as a baker's helper at the Federal Bake Shop in Burlington, followed by a short stint at Facets Bakery. A resident of Mont Montpelier since he was a year old, the senior Redmond moved his employment back home and for 15 years worked at the Cross Baking Company. <clears throat> Around 1950, Redmond began making donuts at his Pearl Street home every Friday evening. He would send his six children throughout the neighborhood to sell the freshly baked goods. In 1955, the family moved to Lincoln Avenue in Montpelier, and there they continued the weekly baking ritual. Word spread about the quality of Redmond's donuts. And soon, using only a small, small stovetop kettle, the Redmonds were producing 15 dozen donuts for their customers. By 1957, the family began selling donuts wholesale to area stores, including some in nearby Barrie. The, the demand proved too great for the Redmond kitchen operation, so in 1960, Paul's Bake Shop was born at its present location. Requests poured in for more jelly donuts and breads, and in 1974, Paul S. incorporated with his sons Paul T. and James, and bought out the Jarvis Bake Shop on Main Street in Barrie. Now under the management of young Paul and Jim, Paul's Bake Shop employs 14 people at their two stores and sells baked goods ranging from their famous donuts to French pastries and wedding cakes. Most of the elder Redmond's recipes for donuts and breads are still being used at the bake shop. Other than the small computer in the back room, mechanization of the operation has remained at a minimum, and many of the baked goods are still cut and prepared by hand. Paul S. Redmond retired in 1978 and lives at the site of the original donut making operation. His sons still have to endure the long days and hard work needed to make the product which lives up to their father's original recipe, but nothing makes work easier than the thought of satisfied customers. <laughs> a, couple story, a couple stories that occur when a family has a longtime legend. They, they delivered donuts to Barry and Montpelier and, and even to Stowe and Val's Market was one of the places that bought their donuts. So uh, packages of donut holes was a big attraction. And so some mother sent this little six or seven year old boy into the market one day to get some donut holes. And he walked in and announced, I want some of Paul's balls. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you, if you knew my father-in-law, he had a twinkle to his eye when he was really tickled about something. And every time he told that story, he would <laughs> laugh and laugh and laugh. So, and so I asked my daughter, who lives in uh, Wilmington, North Carolina, what she remembered about the bakery. And she said, I loved going down to the bakery on Sunday night to take things out of the freezer. She said, I can still smell the smell of the freezer, but the best thing was baking at home with dad. Oh, yeah. So the circle what time went did they close? in 1987. So she was only six years old at that time, but she remembers. So that's my story. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. I think, uh, oh, Bob, would you like to? Yeah, oh, sure. Bob Edison?
My name is Bob Edson. Uh, G. Landel Edson, George's father, did genealogy, and he proved that we are related, although it's a ways back. I was born and brought up in Montpelier. Uh, I had great home as a, as a uh, ninth grade uh, algebra teacher and as a JV football coach. Um, Bill Bigglestone, Donnie's father, was my one of my little league baseball coaches. So, and I, w I was went to graduate from Montpelier High School. Before that, I was of course born at Heaton Hospital, which. In the 30s, my mother graduated from nursing school at Heaton Hospital School of Nursing. I'm a collector. I'm a, I'm a collector, a compulsive collector. I collect stamps. Now, part of stamps is postcards. And I have in my books on the table here a few of my postcards. And I won't prolong anything except that you're, you're very happy to look at any of that. One of them I found was a postcard made of the arsenal that used to be on College Street in Montpelier. And the, the little building is still there, but the arsenal is not there. Um, that and this, this picture is, let's give the Cynthia Mix Brady, the, uh, her dad owned um, Bailey, Bailey Mills here in Montpelier, and George Brady had a printing company in Barrie and became good friends with my wife and myself. And they had, when they sold out of their place in Greensboro, when they moved to Florida permanently, she gave me this picture, which is courtesy of the Vermont Historical Society, but it shows the depot in Montpelier. There's two buildings that are gone that it, are just turtle, totally sad. Yeah. One is the, the uh, depot that was, that was torn down for a parking lot for state employees. The other one was the post office, which oh, was nice. just a magnificent, just a magnificent, and my friend Stan could tell you what kind of architecture it was, just a magnificent architecture. Um, I, I really enjoy collecting postcards. I have about a thousand Montpelier postcards, and I, I'm happy to share them with anybody that wants to look at them. And I, I say one, just one other thing, that I think the Bashara family saved downtown Montpelier. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Thank you all for coming. And the refreshment table is open. And feel free to come up and browse and have some over Thank you all so much for coming.